I think you need to first determine what it is that you really want. So if I were coaching you and we just met and I say to you, hey, Rocky, it's three years from now, you and I are celebrating big because you achieved what? Can you answer that question? Most people aren't very clear on what success is three years from now. And then if I ask them, what is the number one activity that's specific and measurable that you will keep score on that will drive the outcome that you want? I promise you, you will freeze. Most people don't know the answer to the question. Hey, it's Rocky. Welcome to Richer Soul. Today's guest is Mark Moses, who helps CEOs grow their companies and achieve their big goals. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire. It's possible over time and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and create harmony to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. I'm here recording live at GoBundance in Park City, Utah, where we recorded 11 episodes for Richer Soul. GoBundance is all about living the tenants we have talked about on Richer Soul. And now you get to meet people living this life. They vary in age and success, but each of them has found or is finding their path to their ultimate life. They will share how they did it and the lessons learned along the way. I hope they inspire you to find your tribe and take action to live your ultimate life. These bonus episodes will all release on Thursdays each week and have GB and the episode number of the series, so it's easy for you to differentiate them from our normal weekly episode. This series is brought to you by the Profit Answer Man podcast, where I help business owners ensure they are always profitable and can afford the life of their dreams. Check it out if you're a business owner. Today, we're going to talk about making big happen. Can you answer that question at the beginning of what it is that you want And what do you need to do to achieve those results? Defining goals and measuring activities that will result in them is big. And that's what we're here to talk about. Define it for yourself. And as you will hear from Mark, put yourself in the right room with the right people to achieve it. It's really that simple. Mark was a keynote speaker at GoBundance to share how we can all take our companies to the next level and achieve those goals. Mark Moses leads CEO Coaching International, which coaches CEOs on how to dramatically grow their revenues and profits, implement the most effective strategies, become better leaders, grow their people, build accountability systems, and elevate their own performance. Mark has won Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award and the Blue Chip Enterprise Award for Overcoming Adversity. His last company ranked as the number one fastest growing company in Los Angeles and number 10 on the Inc. 500 list of fastest growing private companies in the U.S. CEO Coaching International has appeared in the Inc. 5000 list for the last seven consecutive years. 
Marcus completed 12 full-distance Ironman triathlete triathlons, including the Hawaii Ironman World Championship five times. He also won the U.S. National Squash Championship in 1992. Marks competed in the London Marathon in April 2019, qualifying him for the Boston Marathon. In May 2019, at the CEO Coaching International Summit, Mark had the honor of sitting down for an hour on stage with President George W. Bush to discuss entrepreneurship and his life as president. Let's meet Mark. Welcome to Richard Soul, Mark Moses. It's great to have you join us today. It's great to be with you, too. I'm always excited to learn, and I'm excited to learn from you today. But we like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up, and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Great question. Well, thank you for having me here. I grew up in a small town in Canada, 250 miles north of Toronto, uh, called Sudbury. It was a blue-collar mining town. And what I learned about growing up in a small blue-collar town was that not many of my friends went away to college. They ended up taking jobs. Uh, one of my closest friends went on to become a paramedic. Uh, another one uh, became the manager of uh, the shoe department at Walmart. And my dad had a clothing store called Moses Menswear. And during some tough economic times in the late 70s, the two major mines in town both went on strike, forcing small employers to really struggle. I remember my dad used to come home sometimes and he said, do you know, only one customer came into the store today. Unfortunately, um, my dad ended up going bankrupt in my last year of high school. What it taught me about money was that what you had going at a time or what's going at a time may not always be the same and could change. And it's really about how you deal with the change when adversity strikes. So my business coach over the year said to me often that I always stemmed from fear. And as we unpack that, it was about fear of failing. And um, that money incident with my father losing everything back when I was in my last year of high school, it changed my perspective. So what happened next? I mean, this occurs, he goes through the bankruptcy, you're at the end of high school, you're in this small town. Like, how do you see opportunity out of that? Where did you go? I've unpacked this issue with my brothers. I'm the oldest, and I left and went on to college. My dad gave me $1,000 and said that's all he could do, and hoped that I used it wisely, and to get some loans and some grants, um, and I did. And it really woke me up about money because I, at 18, needed to learn to fend for myself. And um, it's interesting, I'm packing with my brothers because I went on college and I'm off and running. Well, they had more years at home. Um, One had two more years and one had six more years. And he said the struggle that went on at home, watching my mom and dad discuss money and not having any money was tough. As it relates to me, I had a lifeguarding job. I taught swimming, but it wasn't enough to continue to pay for college. So when I was 19, I set up my own business. I walked into the career center and I said, I need to make money. I need to do something big. And I saw a sign that said, make five to $15,000 in the summer. I went, oh my God, in 1985, making that kind of money in a summer, that would be a dream. It only cost $4,500 a year to go to school at my college in Canada. And um, so it was a franchise called Student Painters, and I became a franchisee. That year, I did $70,000 in revenue or sales that summer and made $18,000 that summer. And it was like, wow. I thought I was going to school to become an accountant. I thought, oh my God, I can hire an accountant. So I did it again the next summer. I did $120,000 worth of business. I made $35,000 that summer. I was so, so inspired. 
I thought when I graduate from my school at Wilfrid Laurier University in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, I am going to pack up and move myself to California. And I did. I graduated. I packed a U-Haul. I drove south till I hit Amarillo, Texas. I turned right and eventually arrived in Southern California. I set up a business called Student Painters. Over a four-year period, I opened up 250 locations and had 3,000 people. I sold the business when I was 26. So that was my first run at dealing with adversity, figuring out money by working hard. And I was almost forced into entrepreneurship because I needed to make money after my dad's bankruptcy. Where did that drive come from? Because you have a little adversity, does it make you go from where you are to where you ended up? There's got to be something in there that that spark or that forced you or something inside that made you to be able to make that kind of an impact. My first bout with entrepreneurship was, I think, when I was around 12-ish. And um, being that I grew up in Sudbury... Um, snow was on the ground a lot and uh, people needed their driveways shoveled. So um, I began shoveling driveways for $5. And nice guys like you would say, please go ahead, son, shovel away. And then um, after a season, when I was 13, I said to my younger brother, Alex, hey, Alex, how about I give you $2.50? You do the work. I'll sell the job. And that was my first taste at entrepreneurship. But I also played competitive tennis growing up. I practiced every morning, six days a week. We went out at 6.30, my brother Alex and I. And then we played for fun on Sundays. And my mom required one thing, winning. And we also played the piano, me and both my brothers. And we won in the festival every single time. We may have lost once or twice, but I don't recall it. We wanted everything because it was required. We grew up with a military-type mom who grew up in Mexico City, who it was, you give it your best, and your best is winning. And she was tough on us if we didn't win. So was she an immigrant then to Canada? She was. So it's that immigrant background that kind of... A lot of us who come from that background, that first generation... It's the iron fist of you've got to succeed because... I'll take even further back. My grandparents on my dad's side uh, grew up in, uh, on the border of Romania and Moldova. My grandparents on my mom's side, my grandfather's from Istanbul, and uh, my grandmother is from Paris, and then immigrated. Um, they immigrated, Istanbul and Paris, to Mexico City, and uh, my grandparents from Romania on my dad's side immigrated to this small town in Canada. So a lot of that kind of must succeed drive, but you have to. I mean, if you're going to leave behind your country and come somewhere new, and especially a long time ago, not like today where it's so much easier, you have to have something inside of you, that spark. And it sounds like they transferred that spark to you as well. Well, maybe it's genetic or I grew up with it. I'm not sure, but I, but, but I can't believe in that. Do you have kids? I do. I have two. So what have you done to put the spark in them? Well, it's a great question. So I'll start with my youngest. My youngest, Mason, is uh, um, unfortunately, when he was three years old, um, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. So he grew up with plenty of adversity. First, uh, emergency brain surgery to remove the tumor. Um, Three weeks later, he had complications, had another surgery for hydrocephalus which is water on the brain. Then he couldn't walk um, for about a month until he learned to walk again. And then he had uh, balance problems. Well, he probably still does today, but um, he had meaningful balance problems for the first five years due to the impact of the, of the tumor and the surgery. Now, when he was 12, he said um, one of my buddies um, had uh, throat cancer and they gave him a 50-50 chance to live. So I said to my buddy, hey man, I'm going to sign you up for a half marathon, and um, he goes, man, I'm, I'm going through radiation right now. You need to think positive. I'm going to sign you up for a half marathon next year. 
Well, Mason, my son, says, Dad, at 12, Dad, I want to do that. I say, you sure you can run a half marathon at 12? Dad, I got this. So Mason and Ryan, my buddy, did this together, and they ran the whole thing together and finished together. And uh, both today, by the way, are uh, um, 100% cured, um, both with 50-50 survival rates at that time. Mason then says to me, hey, Dad, I want to do a marathon. I said, son, you're 12 years old. He said, well, maybe we'll pick one out and then uh, we'll go do it together. I said, okay, great. Pick anyone in the world. We'll go do it. He says, dad, I want to go to Antarctica and we'll do one there. I said, that's big shoes, son. So when, we were, when Mason was 14, um, he completed the Antarctica marathon and uh, we stayed in a beautiful hotel. Well, it was more like a tent. Um, on the grounds in uh, Antarctica. It was an Im- amazing experience. So he has become very motivated um, to just try anything and achieve. Uh, he's currently a junior in college today. My daughter, Darian, she wanted to go to the University of Michigan, and she wanted to go and be a D1 athlete and join the crew team. Well, she found her way to get accepted to the University of Michigan got into the biz school, joined the crew team. Then she says, I want to win uh, a Big Ten championship. I said, man, that's that's a big deal. So they won a Big Ten championship. And then COVID came along and they lost that year. And then uh, it's her senior year and she's not sure she's still into it. And then she says, ah, what the heck? I'll give it one more go. But only if we can inspire our team to go after it one more time and win another Big Ten championship, and they did. And so today she works for a client of mine, and and she's loving it. Was there anything that you did, or is it just that? Is it the genetics? Well, I believe that I inspire belief in my kids. As a matter of fact, anybody around me, that you can achieve anything you want in life If you want it bad enough, and you believe in yourself. And that was the message my kids heard growing up. Now, I'll give you an example. Every year on New Year's Day, every year, um, everybody had to present how they did on their prior year's goals. This began when they were like six years old. Um, Goals are posted on the fridge all year long with photos of what they wanted to achieve. So they need to present how they did and then their goals for the upcoming year. And it's amazing when you put your goals in writing, post them where you and the rest of the family can see. And when all your friends come over and say, what's this on the fridge? You have a tendency to achieve those goals. Did their friends ever make fun of them because of that? I don't recall friends ever, that maybe they did to them, but it was pretty cool. I saw many friends, theirs, and my own going, hey, that's pretty cool. You got your goals posted there. And they would put big red check marks when they'd achieve them. And I think that's a big thing. Number one, define your goals. Number two, tell the world. Number three, measure, make it visible. And then it's just the consistency of constantly showing up and just doing it, overcoming the obstacles and just keep going. Man, I'm all in. I I couldn't have said that better. Uh, That resonates with everything in my core and soul. And I, from what I've read of yours, I pretty much uh, believe that very much. So we're here a little bit to talk about your book. What inspired you to write the book, Making Big Happen? Making Big Happen is a sequel to my first book, Make Big Happen. And Make Big Happen was about how do I live the business in life that I want to live? And it's based on four questions. What do I want? How do I get what I want? What's going to stand in the way of me getting what I want? What are are my blind spots in and fears that are going to get in that way. And how do I hold myself accountable to get what I want? So that was the first book, which is really inspiring. The reviews on Amazon are 
are inspiring when I read them, how much people get out of it. And it, the second book, Making Big Happen, took me and my co-authors uh, four years to write. And so there's um, three co-authors I have in this book. And it's really about, we, I get asked all the time, it's amazing that your firm has coached 875 CEOs around the world. It's amazing that you've had over 30 exits for clients of yours, over $100 million up to a billion, and four exits over a billion dollars. What are the practices that allow them to make that happen? And what do I need to do as a leader to make that happen or even close to that happen in my own business? So you and I have met each other and I'm not a very big guy, but my favorite word is big. And so I ask people, what is your big? Making big happen is all about the practices and frameworks that enable CEOs, leaders, and entrepreneurs to achieve. Most people say at the end of a year, well, how'd you do on your goals? Yeah, I had great goals, but I didn't get it done, or I failed to execute this year, or my team failed to execute this year. The book really is an execution framework to help leaders and companies execute. And that's really the secret, right? Show up and execute. Have someone hold you accountable and just keep going. Well, first it's getting, like I'll give you one example. There's a client of mine, uh, his, his name is Rich. And uh, I met Rich um, maybe 11 years ago. And yet an $80 million business just lost $8.5 million. His bank line had been called and he was 60 days from running out of money. So he and I connected up and I didn't want to take him on as a client because this was a mess. And uh, he convinced me um, to take him on as a client. And uh, 39 months later, we sold the business the first time for just under $200 million. 18 months later, um, and, and we sold uh, 80% of it. 18 months later, we sold it again, 80% of it, for a valuation of $550 million. And just recently, in November 1st of 2021, Rich bought his business back for $1.1 billion. It's amazing. He set a goal when we first met to do a billion dollars in sales in 10 years. And his team looked at him and said, dude, you're crazy. We're a mess. He achieved the billion five years early. Amazing. The power of goals. It is. And part of it is having big, hairy, audacious goals, right? Setting that big vision out there, telling the world, not listening to the negativity of you're crazy, we're a mess. This is the one thing that I, that I see with my, some of my clients. They are a mess. And the question they ask me is, where do we even begin to unravel our mess? I think you need to first determine what it is that you really want. So if I were coaching you and we just met and I say to you, hey, Rocky, it's three years from now. You and I are celebrating big because you achieved what? Can you answer that question? Most people aren't very clear on what success is three years from now. And then if I ask them, what is the number one activity that's specific and measurable that you will keep score on that will drive the outcome that you want? I promise you, you will freeze. Most people don't know the answer to the question. So I'll say, hey, li listen, Rocky. It's one year from now. You and I are celebrating big again. You're living the dream because you achieve what? Now, you, a year from now, you got to be able to answer that question. But if I asked you again, what's the number one specific and measurable activity you will keep scoring to drive the outcome that you want? You may not know. As a matter of fact, most people don't know. I'll give you an example. It's a client of mine out of Kansas City. He says, Mark, I'd like to do $70 million in new business next year. 
I said, what's the number one specific and measurable activity that will drive that outcome? He says, prospect meetings. I said, well, good. How many? He says, 400. I said, you do 400 prospect meetings? You'll do 70 million in new business? He said, absolutely. Now I'm looking for the root activity. What's the number one specific and measurable activity that you're going to keep score on that's going to drive you getting 400 prospect meetings? He says, 2,000 people come to my seminars and listen to me over the course of a year. I said, hey, man, you're handsome and, and a pretty good speaker, but 2,000 people coming to listen to you? How are we going to get 2,000 people to do that? He said, easy, man. It's 21,000 phone calls to engineering firms in Kansas City. So where does this break down? If we don't make the calls, we don't get people to the seminars. We don't get the people to the seminars. We don't get the prospect meetings. And then we miss our goal of $70 million in new business. This particular year, he did all of that and generated $84 million in new business. I don't think most people realize that business is all math and very basic math. And it's essentially what you talked about. You know, where does the math equation start? And it starts with leads. How do you get leads? It's impressions to leads, to your conversion rate, to the average cost of a sale and, and all the way through. And then looking at the back end, what is it going to cost you to do all of that? And what does that lead to your profit? And if you're good, you can figure out all those ratios over time and improve them. And it only takes small improvements in each. You achieve the results. But most people don't do the business of math. Hey, listen, the same, the same strategy can apply to athletics. So li listen, I have done marathons all over the world. I've done the North Pole. I've done the South Pole. I've done the Great Wall. And I've also done 12 full distance Ironman triathlons including the world championship in Hawaii five times. So one year I said, can I apply this same methodology to the speed I can do an Ironman triathlon in? So what are the specific and measurable activities I can keep score on to drive me to achieve a certain amount of time in each of the legs in the Ironman? And uh, an Ironman, as you probably know, is big 2.4 mile swim, followed by a 112 mile bike, followed by a full 26.2 mile marathon. Um, and you do it all in one day, no stopping for lunch or a nap or shopping or whatever you're into. Um, so this if you're doing 12 hours in an Ironman, you're considered a pretty good, a pretty good athlete. And I had gone 11.55, 11.50. Fifty. I said, I wonder if I could go under 11 hours and do a 10-something. Now, that's moving into the big boy leagues. And, uh, and so I figured out all the specific and measurable activities, and most of them were around the pacing on the bike and the pacing on the run and how I needed to train to enable me to do that in a race. Well, when the race was over, I was at 10 hours and 56 minutes and won the race. Congratulations. Thank you. Let's take it a step further because I think the same thing applies to people in their life as well, right? It's whatever it is that they want to achieve, whatever they want out of life, you just have to sit down and figure out the measurables to, to be able to do that. And for most people, you can reverse engineer it because people always get, what's my first step? That's where they get stuck. I always say it's harder to go from zero to one than from one to a hundred. But if you can reverse engineer everything backwards, figure out the steps and figure out the next one that you need to take in this moment, you can probably achieve any big goal that you have. No disagreement for me. Uh, you're singing my song. So let's shift gears a little bit. What does it mean to live an abundant life to you? Describe to me what you mean by an abundant life. You know what? It's an open definition because everyone's got their own definition, don't they? That's a big word for a small town Canadian. Describe to me what you mean by abundant. It means to me, an abundant life means that you're living on your terms, the way you choose to live based on what you've decided and you have the ability to do it. And part of it is the ability to say no, which I think is a big part of it. No, I'm not doing that. No, I'm not doing this. 
yes, I want to do this and I'm just going to go do it. Thank you for the further clarification. So for me, um, I, I like the, the concept of no and learning what to say no to. And I, one, of my, one of the things that I'm, I deeply believe in is to spend my time on the things and the people that increase my energy and eliminate all the things and the people that deplete it. And to me, when I realized that in my 30s, it became so much more clarifying and gratifying to spend the times that, that uh, spend my time on the things that were meaningful to me. One of the things I did way back when is my wife and I, newly married, even with young kids, would go away once a quarter, just the two of us, um, to on vacation, just to reconnect and get out of the world and uh, have fun together, as opposed to, you know, once you become a parent, everything can go haywire. And um, that was really healthy for us. Now we do it a, a week a month. And um, it's been amazing. And for fun, um, I travel over 100 days a year personally. Um, this summer, I plan to take my yacht over to um, Europe for the first time and spend four months in the Mediterranean living, um, sharing my time with my wife and friends and family um, on the yacht and exploring the Med. And that's living the life that I want to live. Most people dream about that. I used to dream about it too. And I believe that that would happen someday. And it's amazing. You write down your goals, write them down. Share them, read them every day. You know, there are premises in the book, Think and Grow Rich, that tell you to read. And, you know, this book, book goes back to the 30s by Napoleon Hill that talk about this premise of write your goals down, read them twice a day, and you'll eventually achieve them. Life is pretty simple. For some reason, doing simple is hard. Why do you think people just don't do this? Great question. The people I know do it, uh, it's, I guess you are who you hang with, hang with winners and you will be one too. Hang about, hang around with a whole bunch of people that don't live the, that kind of life while well, you won't live it either. So I've told my kids and when I used to go speak at my kid's school, I, I, one of the things that I would say is hang out with winners, you'll be a winner. Hang out with losers, you'll be a loser too. And, um, and I really, I really believe that uh, you are, you are who you hang with. And that's true. You are the average of the five people that you're most around. And so it's being careful to pick the right five people to be around. If you don't like the room you're in, find another room. I think people struggle with that. Well, that's their issue. And I like to say, don't make your issues, my issues, make the decision to live the life that you want. Look, there are three kinds of people, those that make big happen, those that let things happen, and those that ask, what happened? You, at some point, need to decide what kind of life that you want to live. You want to keep living the same life that you're living? That's on you. You want to change it, put a stake in the ground and change it, or don't. And that's one of the things I've learned. I no longer try to pull people up the mountain. I no longer try to help, you know, it's more about, hey, if you'd like to come run up this mountain, let's go. But I'm not going to tell you to run up it because I, I don't have the energy to pull people up. And it's learning to say no. Again, it comes back to that of just letting go is finding the people who are willing to run like your son. I want to run. You didn't have to. I'm guessing you never had to say to him, get out and do the work. He wanted to do it, and so you just helped him to do it. I did not have to tell him to go out there and run those 20 milers. He said, Dad, where do I get the training program? I put the training program in front of him, and I wanted to go run with him. He says, no, Dad, I got this, doing it on my own. That was one of the secrets I learned with my kids, was to stop pushing them to do things and letting them figure out what they wanted and let me pull, pull me along to drop them off or put them in front of the right people to be able to do that. And I think the same goes 
for everyone else. Man, you bring up a can of worms. So it's interesting. Um, I'm a bit of the tough love parent in that uh, I like my kids to struggle some. It's good. Um, my wife, um, on the other hand, is uh, um, doesn't like our kids to struggle as much, so enables them a little more than um, well than I do for sure. There's probably some balance in there, and there's a place for each of those. And um, it just seems to work in our our family. Although I I come at it more from a tough love standpoint and a struggle standpoint. I think the greatest gift my father ever gave me was the gift of his bankruptcy because it forced me to figure it out, either get a job or find a way to pay for college and go to college. And that was on me. I could have said, hey, man, it's really unfortunate my dad went bankrupt. I guess I don't get to go to college now. Well, that's a decision that I would have needed to live with regardless. We have the same dynamic in our house. You know, I'm the one who does the tough love. My wife, more often, wants to baby them. And I'm like, that's not what's going to make them strong. They, they need the adversity to give them that fire in the belly and let them know that it's up to them and they need to pull themselves up. And I, it's definitely, it's something I see with a lot of parents. And it's one of those things that I'm just trying to change. Like, your kids have to struggle a little. Rocky, I believe that nothing ever great was achieved without adversity and the desire to march on and that that adversity, fighting back from adversity, is great learning. Sometimes you win. Sometimes you learn. It's all good. That was the uh, saying we had for our soccer team. Sometimes we win. Sometimes we learn. And you better be learning if you're not winning. (laughs) So you're talking about make big happen. What's one of the biggest things that's happened in your life? Uh, one of the biggest things that I'm most proud of was um, I said to my dad when he was 82, Dad, where in the world do you want to go and that you've never seen? I mean, someday you, you'll be old and then you'll die. Where do you want to go? He said, Son, I'd love to go to China. And so at 82 years old, my dad, my son Mason and I um, went to, uh, to China. We did uh, Hong Kong. Shanghai, Beijing. It was amazing. And uh, that gave me the opportunity while I was there to run the Great Wall Marathon too. And my son, uh, um, I think he was like 11, did the 8K on, uh, on the wall. It, uh, it was amazing. And, um, and then uh, my dad then turns 85. I said, Dad, you want to do one of those crazy trips again? Where in the world do you want to go this time? He says, son, I've never been to Prague. I want to go to Prague. And uh, so my dad and I, just the two of us, did two weeks, Berlin, Prague, Bratislava, Slovakia, Vienna, and Budapest. It was an amazing, amazing experience for the two of us to share together. And I'll tell you one more thing, Rocky, that I'm, I'm super proud of. Um, I recently just finished um, a legacy video, and I've heard of this before. And I belong to this organization uh, called R360 that pushed me into doing this. And the legacy video, really, it's, I think it's about 33 minutes long. And uh, on the video, we have my dad, 90 years old, my mom, my two brothers, two of my closest friends, both of my kids, and my wife. And the intent of the video is really for my grandkids and great-grandkids and great-great-grandkids that never knew me, us, and it's my parents, and it's an amazing opportunity. And um, I'm, I'm super proud that I now have that complete, and I can provide future generations with a little backstory to our family and where we came from. And I think that's one of the things that is now possible today. If you think about 100 years ago, that wasn't a possibility. There is so much more that's possible today than ever, and people should take advantage of it. I mean, we all have iPhones. How hard is it for you to create your own? There's no barriers to you. If you want to do it, do it, right? Go make big things happen. Create the legacy for your family. I like you got the wording now. Go make big happen. Uh, Man, it 
That's infectious, isn't it here, Rocky? It is very infectious. That, that's what it's all about. So I'm, it's not really surprising, but before we started recording, you talked about meeting the president and interviewing him. Yet that wasn't part of your big story because it really comes down to family, right? Much more important than hanging out with the president. But let's tell that story anyway for our audience. Yeah, you know what? It was amazing. Uh, I host this annual event for CEOs around the world every year. And uh, this particular year, I came home one day and I said uh, to my wife and son, my, do- my daughter was off in college. I said, um, hey, I got this great idea for our upcoming annual event. I- I'd like to in- interview uh, the president. And, um, and my son says, in a snippy voice, he says, Dad, everybody you know is a president and CEO, so what's the big deal? I said, no, son. I mean, the president of the United States or a president of the United States. And he says, Dad, that's ridiculous. You're not going to get a president of the United States come to your business event. Well, four months later, we got George W. Bush on the main stage. And whether you were... Whether you liked him or did not, when he was in office, everybody liked him on that day. He was funny. He was Texan. He was passionate about everything that he did. And uh, he was super engaging, and everybody loved him. He was really world class. And he let me ask him questions about just about anything except Trump, Clinton, and Obama. Everything else was fair game, and, and it, it was a super engaging interview. And, and, and you know what? In fairness, uh, Rocky, it is an event that uh, took place. Uh, that uh, It's an event that I'm pretty proud of, being a Canadian from a small town, getting to interview the former president of the United States for eight years and leader of the free world. So it was a, it was a real special time. I was nervous as heck, and I never get nervous. And a Secret Service all around us and bomb dogs and all that. It was, uh, this is really an experience I hadn't experienced before. So it was absolutely awesome. Sounds like fun. I wish I had been there. Yeah, me too. <laughs> you were. <laughs> I wish you were there, Rocky. <laughs> so true. I will tell you, just in, in the research I did for this interview, The amount of materials that you have for business owners, the amount of questions and and templates and all of that stuff that is out there is quite phenomenal. You're giving it all away for free. It's not like you're asking for anything in return. And that's a big part of of legacy and giving back. Um, And it's wonderful that you do that. I want to encourage people to go check that out. And I don't care if you're everyone is a CEO right? You're the CEO of your life. You better define it. You better figure it out. You, these principles, these questions, they apply to us as people, our business, our life, our family. It doesn't matter the situation. Go do it and make it happen. You mean to say make Big happen. Make Did you big know happen. Yeah, I got to practice that. I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll get it. I should have brought you a copy and you had it right here so you could practice. We will do that. If people want to make Big Happen, learn more about you, follow your work, what is the best way for them to do that? Yeah, they could check us out at CEOcoachinginternational.com. We provide all kinds of content. It's all free. And if they wanted to, if they had an interest in reading Make Big Happen or Making Big Happen, um, they're both available on Amazon you could listen listen to it by Audible if you want. You can get it on your Kindle, or if you want to go old school with the uh, hardcover, you can do that too. Thank you, and I will make sure to put that all in the show notes, and thank you for joining us today. Rocky, thank you. To all you out there, go make big happen. Are you ready to make big happen? We all have a choice, and as you can see from Mark's backstory, your past doesn't dictate your future. However, you need to define that big future and figure out what steps you need to take to achieve those results. What do you need to do to make that happen? Then find the people who will support you and get to moving. It's really that simple. Thanks for listening. If you like today's episode, please share it with your friends and family. I would appreciate that. Have an abundant week.